Okay, I think we can get started. So let's see if uh, a couple more people will show up later, but as usual, you can also watch it on YouTube, so mm. unintended consequences. All right, so um, today's topic will be Android internals. Um, I'll go into that in a minute. So first, let's just briefly look at the organizational stuff again. Um, on Friday, we will have project meetings again. So I'll post a, a schedule on YouTube and then we can each project uh, and I will meet for 10 minutes and we can, as I already said, we can discuss what, where the project is and what still needs to be done. And so what the, the presentation will be about briefly and what's, what's coming afterwards until the end of the semester. Um, don't forget to register for the exam uh, that starts on June 27th, so I think next Monday. Um, so uh, you actually need to be registered now. So uh, that's, I think that's pretty new for a, for a few years. That wasn't that strict, but now you really need to register in Bison. Um, then we will have one more lecture and then the, the presentations in uh, about two weeks, three weeks. Um, July 13th, we will have the exam preparation and on the 27th, the exam itself. Um, yeah, so much for the organizational stuff. The schedule for the meetings on Friday, uh, again, I'll post in Moodle so everyone will get it by email. Um, and now let's look, basically look under the hood of Android. So what's, what's happening inside? I already uh, gave a, a brief overview of how the, the main components of Android work together in the lecture on security. So we have um, the bootloader, we have this uh, minimal recovery system, then we have the data partition, and the ones we are going to focus on today are the, the boot partition, which is just mostly a Linux kernel, and the actual system partition, which is the, the core of the Android system. Um, so here's a uh, more or less complete overview of what the, the different components of, of Android actually are. So I'll try to briefly go through them. On the very top, we have the applications. Of course, any app you install will run on the very top of the stack. Um, below that, we have the uh, different frameworks, like um, uh, you've probably already worked with some of them, different managers like um, this, this activity manager uh, or the window manager, the different content providers. These are also uh, applications, but applications that are already basically locked into the system. Um, they're still written in Java and run on top of these libraries like um, the uh, Surface Manager, for example, or SQLite when you want to store data and so on. And um, connected to that is the actual Android runtime. I'll go into a bit more detail uh, on that later on. And on the bottom of everything, there's just a more or less regular Linux kernel. So what's important to keep in mind is that um, uh, everything shown in blue here is basically written in Java, and everything below here in yellow, green, red is written in C and C++. So these libraries are C libraries, and on top of these libraries we have this uh, virtual machine, and then these core libraries, the services, and the apps running in Java. So that's the the main, main split uh, inside of Android. Um, oh. oh, come on. This is really annoying. Okay, so a few things I'd like to look into more detail today um, is from the bottom here, the inter-process communication which Android uses, then the C library, and especially the Delvic virtual machine and why this isn't just a regular Java virtual machine because there's, there, there are some subtle differences. Okay, so um, first step would be to look into the kernel, the lowest layer. Um, so on a very high level, you can say that Android is 
a Linux-based system, but that's not entirely correct. So um, the problem is that you can't take the official Linux kernel, which is running on Ubuntu or Debian or whatever, and directly use that for an Android device. There's two different reasons. The one is that um, Android uses a slightly different uh, version of inter-process communication. Maybe you've already heard of this term, so there's different ways of communicating between different processes on the same, uh, on the same host. There's uh, sockets, there's shared mem memory, semaphores, and so on. And Android introduces an additional uh, channel for communicating between processes that's called binder. Um, this has actually been merged into the official Linux kernel sometime in 2015, but there are still more subtle differences between uh, what's used on Android and what the official Linux kernel uses. And they're very slowly converging, but there are still some additional differences. That's one half of the equation. You can, of course, just download the Android version of the Linux kernel uh, from Google, but uh, in many cases, that's not enough. The problem, the second problem is that you also need drivers for the hardware. So each phone uh, has a very specific combination of hardware devices like accelerometer, display controller, sound chip, and so on and so on. And every one of these needs a driver. And uh, Linux, of course, contains a very, very wide range of drivers, so the official kernel, but uh, not for all, uh, so the, the drivers in the Linux kernel are slightly more focused towards laptops and desktop machines and servers. So if, um, if some, some phone vendor now creates an Android device, then they, they sometimes have very specific drivers which they don't uh, make available as open source. They actually should do that, and in theory, they are even uh, legally obliged to do so. But uh, if it's some, some vendor in, in Shanghai, uh, they often just simply don't care, and they don't publish the source code of the drivers. So they only have closed source drivers, even though the Linux kernel itself is open source. Uh, for it to actually run on a specific phone, you need, um, in addition to the kernel, you need these closed source drivers. And that often makes it very difficult to, to build the, um, the kernel by yourself. The only devices where you can be sure that you can get the, uh, the entire kernel so you are able to build it yourself are actually the, the Nexus devices from Google. There you can also get these, these drivers uh, directly from Google and then you can build the entire kernel yourself and can also modify it, which is still quite involved, but it's at least, at least uh, possible without having to, to ask some manufacturer. Um, I don't know. So now let's have a look at what Binder does. Um, Again, binder is a method of communicating between uh, processes. And here specifically, it provides a way to call a procedure remotely in another process. So this is used to communicate from an app to a service, for example. So um, uh, maybe in one of, of your apps you've written already, you've also already communicated with a, with a service. Maybe you've even already written your own service. And this is always a separate process from the app. And to call some function in the, uh, in the service, uh, binder is used. So um, in general, the, the overall architecture looks like this. You have a proxy object in the app. On this proxy object, you call a method. The, these both share uh, an interface, and via the binder driver, the actual call will then be forwarded to the, to the service, which then uh, calls the, the appropriate method on the object itself inside the service. And of course, yeah, they need the same interface so that the, the, um, the signature of the method is, is the same. 
<clears throat> so there's actually there's two different modes uh, in which binder can be used. One is an asynchronous mode. Here the uh, the caller, so the app, uh, sleeps or is basically blocked until the service is able to do the request. So um, here the app starts the call, then uh, it's, uh, it's put into sleep by the, so the, the app doesn't do anything, the control is handed over to the kernel driver, and at some point um, the service will then basically send a response. And uh, once, once the, uh, the entire call is finished, then the app and the service will again start to run uh, uh, asynchronously. The other way around would uh, then be the synchronous mode. Here the service waits until a request is made. Um, and uh, as soon as the request is made, it's serviced by the, um, by the service, sending back a reply, and that will then be propagated back to the, to the app. So there's uh, either you have a service that's waiting for, um, for incoming requests and then immediately services them, or the app has to wait for the service to actually um, have time to, to service the request. So that always depends on the application scenario, which method is, is more appropriate, but a binder uh, enables you to do both. Um, okay, well, so much for inter-process communication. Now, um, oh yeah, sure. Exactly, yes. So there's, this, this is actually, uh, it happens more or less the same on any operating system. As soon as you, I mean, the, the, most, uh, the most simple approach to actually communicating between two different processes would just be to uh, open a network connection to localhost. And that, it's exactly the same, then it also goes through the, the driver for the, for the loopback interface, and um, also somehow has to pass through the kernel. So uh, there's only one exception, in a sense, uh, which is shared memory. This is also a form of inter-process communication. This is actually not specific to Android, but it's available anywhere, um, where you just have one memory block that can be accessed by both applications at the same time. But then you still somehow need the kernel to, uh, to make sure that uh, both applications don't, for example, write to the same location at the same time and create garbage. So uh, you always need the kernel or a, a kernel driver to somehow mediate between the two processes. And uh, of course, binder is heavily optimized, so this uh, doesn't take too much uh, processing power and too much time. Um, but there's still at least one additional call that, that somehow needs to go through the, uh, through the driver. Okay, so now let's go one step up from the kernel. Next would be the, uh, the C libraries inside, uh, inside Android. And the, mm, the one of the, the most basic ones is the libc, the standard C library. This is also something that's used on just about any, uh, any operating system in some way. This is uh, a very simple library which just gives you very basic functions like getting the length of a string or printing something to the console and so on. Um, and the, what, what Android now uses is called Bionic. This is a, uh, yeah, a re-implementation of this uh, C library by Google for licensing reasons. So the original uh, libc uses GPL or LGPL and that was sort of too, too much of a uh, restrictive license from the point of view of Google. So they built another implementation and uh, 
gave it a BSD license, which, which is more permissive, especially for companies. Um, the one drawback is that it's, again, not entirely 100% uh, compatible with the C library. This is especially a problem if you want to compile some kind of uh, low-level uh, low console program for Android. Then you uh, need to deal with the differences between libc and Bionic. Um, one example is that Bionic doesn't have uh, very good C++ support, or at least used to have, so it didn't uh, support exceptions or the entire stuff from the standard template library. I think that's uh, changing now, but uh, it's still not exactly one and the same. So you, sometimes if you have a, some kind of low-level C program, then you won't be able to directly compile it on Android because of these differences between the two libraries. Um, 